Welcome to the People Who Read People podcast with me, Zach Elwood. In this episode, I interview Professor Karina Kurostalina about insults, specifically political and cultural insults, which can play a role in political conflict and wars. Kurostalina wrote a book called Political Insults, How Offenses Escalate Conflict, in which she created a category system for political insults. And we talk about some of the ideas in that book. Professor Krostalina is a social psychologist whose work focuses on social identity and dynamics of identity and power in protracted social conflicts. She works at George Mason University. She's a director of the Program on Prevention of Mass Violence and the Program on History, Memory, and Conflict at the School for Conflict Analysis and Resolution. Okay, here's the interview. Hi, Dr. Cora Stalina. Thanks for coming on. Hello. Hi. So let's start with how big a role would you say insults and the feeling of being insulted play in political conflicts? It's a very interesting question because um, I study identity-based conflicts for many, many years. And one of the major tools how to study conflicts is to explore what mechanisms are used by different parties to control power, increase legitimacy, to control social boundary between groups. And I found that insult was very often used not only by leader on leader, but mostly between groups. That's why I was very interested to explore how identity-based conflicts are shaped by such political insults. In your book, Political Insults, you came up with categories for political insults like, for example, legitimacy insult, divergence insults, projection insults, to name a few of them. Mm -hmm. And it seems like the goal of your work was to come up with a methodology for being able to categorize these insult types. Is is that accurate to say? Yes, absolutely. Um, Then I started, then somebody asked me, do you know there are any... um, theories of insult because this was coming up in political landscape of United States and other countries. I start looking in the literature and I found there are good news and bad news. Uh, Bad news, there are no theory of insult and good news, there are no theory of insult. So I have opportunity. (laughs) Yes, I can work on it. There are a lot of concepts very similar like uncivility. Uh, There are uh, other conceptual ideas like aggression, but they were not really capturing what I was trying to find, how insult uh, constructed in identity-based conflict. So I did use specifically identity-based theories, for example, theory of social boundary or theory of need for positive self-esteem. This is a very foundational for social identity theory that we need positive self-esteem. That's why we compare ourselves with other group and put them down. And other theories of power and identity to create these tools, six particular tools. And what is important for it, for, it's not just for analysis. What the major thesis of my um, theory is that if we know what insult people are using and it's, we, we recognize it, then we actually know what are real needs of insulting party behind this insult. So it's really not only analyzing conflict, but it's also helped us analyze initial motivation and initial needs and address these needs if we really care about the party, or it will give us more knowledge about what this party lacks to uh, be more powerful in our dealing with this party. So understanding the the processes, the the pathways behind the feelings of the insults allows you to do more to to solve the problem better, like do better negotiations and mediations. Is that is that accurate? Yes, but it's also deeper. It's not just feelings; it's actually needs. For example, if person is uh, using the um, identity insult, it means this person needs recognition, needs to increase self-esteem. That's why it's using insult to put others. Or if person is using the, say, power insult, it means that person needs or group needs power, it's experience unbalance of power and want to increase it or change this balance. So it means that they're using this insult to decrease power of the others. So every time when we see 
uh, then people using particular insult, it means that they have some needs. It's not coming as just aggression or mm-hmm. incivility as it described in other theories. How well do your insult categories carry over to non-political insults, like just insults in everyday life? Oh my God, it's it, it's so interesting because I see it and as soon as I develop the theory, again, I, you develop theory as a tool. You're not developing theory for the sake of this theory. And I see that everywhere. And actually, uh, even my students who uh, read the book or my friends who read the book, uh, they tell, oh, this is the type of itself. <laughs> so it's really helping. Like, And you see it in everyday life. It's really uh, seeing uh, how people do employ it. And actually, it's it's helping to deal. I think it's really empower you if you know that people use an insult because they do have needs. Mm-hmm. So it's actually helping you. Oh, okay, you're using this insult because you are not happy with yourself. So it's actually help you not to feel insulted. Yeah, when I was reading your book, I thought of going through uh, rap song and country song lyrics because you can. There's a lot of this like you're not really true country or you're not really true uh, hip hop lifestyle or whatever. I, you can find a lot of insults in, in both of those genres. I thought it'd be fun to go through and categorize insults in those, in those genres. Yeah. yeah, actually, song analysis of songs is very important. I have a student now who just completed her thesis, wonderful thesis, about um, uh, songs of Kurdish uh, bands who, who write songs to address the Kurdish-Turkish conflict. And it's a lot of themes which really uh, we found in the songs which were specifically addressing the relationship between two groups. Yeah, there's that Spanish rapper who was, um, he was basically arrested for insults to the king. Yeah, it's the same as Pussy Riot. The one I wrote in this book uh, was very interested how these girls, uh, which, I don't know, there are some ideas that they were naked, they were not at all. They were just singing in a church. And why they were singing in a church? Because this church was really positioned as a church which legitimize and empower current Russian president. So they were just seen in song where they were insulting the um, power and they were trying to uh, show that it's not legitimate. But the government actually used completely different insults and presented this insult to population because they had to legitimize their treatment of these girls so they show, look, they were singing in a song, song in a church. That's why they insult religion. And this uh, church was also devoted to the veterans of the war. So they insult veterans. So it's how, it's how you position it, how you create. For me, the, the key word here is construction of insult. Mm, right. So it's the construction of, of insult, which uh, makes me think of, uh, you know, I see these Trump emails that I get them on the list. And a, a big part of that is them trying to equate uh, when the liberals, when the Democrats attack me, Trump, they're insulting all of you, which is a common kind of cult psychology thing, too, to say any criticism of the leader is an insult to all of us. And I'm wondering, is that have you studied that at all? Yes, I actually discuss it in the types of insults. I discuss uh, that some insults are transferred or learned and how leaders as a prototypes, uh, and we have a, such a word, prototype in uh, social psychology and somebody who represents basic, basic values, ideas, beliefs of the group. So how these leaders construct insult for the group and tell the group, you should feel like this way. And that's why I really discuss this very in details, how insult can be learned by the group, even people do not feel it. But speaking about Trump, it's very important because I wrote another book, which is Trump Effect, in which I one of the chapters was specifically how he mastered insults as a tool of reducing power of other people, reducing their legitimacy, Reduce, stressing boundary between him and other people. So he he really mastered insult in uh, not just in personal relations, but in a group relation, political mm. relation. Yeah, I think that's still a underappreciated aspect of these dynamics because I think there's so many Trump supporters 
and I've, you know, I've talked to people and heard this firsthand that their reason for supporting Trump is because liberals, specific liberal friends of theirs or people online have been mean to them. And, you know, it's the, it's this association, which, you know, as you say, Trump has uh, excelled in, in, in associating any insults to an individual or any, even insults to the group. He's, he's harnessing that power and that's a big part of his support. And I, and I've heard people, there was a, a radio call in on a, on a political show recently, I heard where someone directly said, I'm voting for Trump because basically because some liberal people he knew on Facebook were mean to him, which, you know, this, this isn't really logical. Like the Democrat leaders are not, you know, making those insults. I think these are underappreciated dynamics. I think, yeah, I think we really have to here to uh, acknowledge that in every single group dynamic, there are some extreme ends of it, of each group. And we really have to acknowledge that, yes, insult produced by both groups. We could not be conflict analysis uh, specialists. We could not be scholars in conflict analysis. We will not really see dynamics from both sides. But it's unbalanced, of course. And as you're right, there is also a lot of dynamics when leadership teach people how to recognize insults and make them, I called it sensitizing to insult in my book. So then sensitize particular groups to recognize insults. So it seems like modern communication technologies, whether it's a large number of cable TV channels or the internet, it seems like these technologies lend themselves to the capability of more and more people to be able to find insults and be insulted. And that could be, you know, for example, a rural person watching a TV show where rural people are the butt of a joke or a fundamentalist Muslim person learning about depictions of Muhammad, you know, happening thousands of miles away. So it seems like the greater transparency of our world means that there's always something somewhere for a group to be insulted about. Would you agree with that? And do you see that perhaps as playing a role in increased political polarization? Oh, I absolutely agree. The Unfortunately, this great invention, new technologies of internet, of mass media, of, of uh, new media platforms and uh, public uh, platforms, they actually, instead of just bettering the society, what the idea was, and they did, right? Uh, at the same time, they created a lot of uh, negative intergroup dynamics. I completely agree that uh, they contribute to identity-based conflicts, and there are a lot of research, for example, the anonymity of being behind a particular name really give people more opportunities to be aggressive without feeling responsibility. It's increased aggressiveness, and we also see this crowd effect on the mass media where people insult one person supported by another person that creates this uh, snowballing where people are like, become uh, groups of people become extremely aggressive and insult reproduced and increased through this uh, dynamics on media unfortunately mm. so it seems like social media especially adds a whole new level of things because uh you know with cable tv obviously the more and more channels there were the more possibility for insult there was but now you have social media where you can directly insult people and be, be directly insulted and i'm wondering do you see that as a as an even more ramping up of of this kind of dynamic unfortunately yes absolutely agree and, and one way to insult person face to face you have to have courage or at least you have to hold more power right mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but if you do it in the internet it's this remo remove access and also again anonymity create redu reducing social uh, control over how people can insult and it's become actually honorable to insult other side in media because you will get cheered by your peers. Some people perceive leaders like Trump who use bombastic insulting language. Some some people perceive that as a strong leader, and I think that's that can be the role behind some support of you know these kind of strong men, authoritarian leaders. Uh, but considering your work and other other similar work, there's obviously some major risks involved with uh, when it comes to leaders who insult other groups and people. 
with your work, have you, do you, when you see such speech like that from leaders, do you feel like you see the danger much more inherent in that kind of speech compared to, you know, someone who hasn't studied this, these kind of topics? Oh, this is a very important question and very, very uh, uh, good question because the first, what we really have to understand is what is power. And for years, uh, we were believing that power is equal to coercion and control over ability of other person to pursue his or her goal. And this conception of power and being a strong and bombardic, as you told, was really prevailing in social sciences, but also in the human minds. Uh, but recently, more and more research, especially in social identity research, shows that coercion is not a power, it's coercion. Power comes with ability to persuade people, ability to inspire people, ability to make people do what you do without coercing them, because without pushing them. So then I see um, such bombardic behavior as, as uh, Trump, very aggressive um, behavior, and we, what he's using, he's using instrumental aggression, right, in comparison with, say, for example, frustration as aggression. And this instrumental aggression uh, and insults, power insult, legitimacy insult, they come in exactly because he doesn't feel power. Actually, then people behave like this. For me, it's a clear symptom showing that these people feel that they do not have enough power how they wish it to have. So this is very important to realize that power really comes in with the ability to convince people based on your own example. On your And he, he has it too. We really have to see that he does empower a lot of people by other examples. But I would not say that aggressive behavior shows the, the power. It is opposite. Right. It's, it's like an immature version perception of what power is. It's like just storming around and insulting people. And, you know, whereas... It, t- it takes a lot more uh, discipline and, and... Yeah, like power comes and somebody tells, let's do it together. And people, yes, let's do it together. This is power, right? But if you tell, we're doing it over or you will, you will be punished, then it's not power. What comes to mind for me is Trump sending childish insults to, um, you know, North Korea and, you know, people and Trump supporters think that's some sort of show of power. But to me and probably many and, and many people, it's just a it's a scary thing because, you know, with with your work in mind, you, you see how insults can play a big role and in, in riling up tensions and leading to unnecessary conflicts and yeah, North Korea is another, I wrote the chapter on North Korea uh, in the book. It's a very, I think what what, what uh, Trump was doing there is really uh, mimicking uh, their behavior. Oh, mimicking, yeah. Be- yeah, because what North Korea is, uh, actually North Korean leader is doing exactly, he's employing insult all the time and aggression, instrumental aggression, because this is how he wants to show to his people this is power is. This very coercive power. And I actually found in my other research in Ukraine and Russia uh, that power, perception of power, meaning of power there is really coercion. The, the public opinion or public understanding how power function really very, very simplistic. So people who have more control over others consider it those who have power. But in reality, people have power only if other people give them power, right? So you could not have power if other people do not accept it. From an amateur um, perspective, the one thing that seemed not as scary about Trump's behavior was the fact that it didn't seem like anyone actually took him seriously because, you know, for example, with North Korea, North Korea leaders seem to know that they're kind of playing a role. Like, as you say, they're they're using insults and, and being aggressive. And it seemed like they knew that Trump is doing similar things. So that there was that going for us. But you can easily imagine how if you're dealing with people who actually will take uh, emotional, have emotional responses to your insults, it becomes a lot more dangerous. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. It seems to me that our psychological need for conflict and, and feelings of group insult uh, seem to make uh, long-term human existence 
unlikely, uh, especially when you consider, you know, future, near future destructive technologies we might have. Uh, and I'm wondering how pessimistic or optimistic you might be about, you know, humanity's long-term uh, existence. I actually very optimistic because um, when we see violence, we see more violence now because A, we live in, right now, right? And B, because media really show all these instances of violence all the time, because this is how they sell newspapers or something else. But in reality, if you analyze, violence strongly decreased. If we look into Middle Ages or we look even 18th, 19th century or 20th century, uh, it's the longest time we live without like a big war. There are still some small wars, and I'm myself from Ukraine originally. It's still so painful for me to see it there. But it's a, uh, the amount of violence toward women, toward sexual minorities, toward people with mental disabilities, toward prisoners. It's, we still have a lot of violence, but it's incomparable with violence which were before in, uh, in society. So I think we, realize, we get more humanity, more compa- compassion. I see very positive tendencies. So again, I'm very worried about social media impact on dynamics and how it can provoke violence. But I think we're in a good place. I'm pretty concerned about the internet effects too. I think it's underappreciated how much impact that has. But yeah, to your point, I I think it's also underappreciated how much the ubiquity of video recordings in society, modern society has helped improve things too, because it's so easy to get caught doing something that is perceived as shameful that I feel like I don't see that talked about much, but that I think that's really helped us in the last few decades too. Yes, because if you look in violence, again, connecting it to your previous question, if you look which violence produced more death or which identity was most violent, and if you compare, for example, ethnic conflict, religious conflict, and ideological conflict, and ask yourself which particular identity was most violent, you will be surprised to know that it was ideological identity. It's not ethnic conflicts, it's not religious conflicts, it's ideological conflicts which kill most of the people. It's Stalinist repressions, it's uh, Cambodia Khmer Rouge, it's Nazi uh, uh, ideology because it was, yes, it was um, against ethnic group, but it also was, uh, Holocaust also was connected with uh, people with disabilities, communists, sexual minorities. So it was ideological structure. So if you look at it, ideology is the most dangerous social identity. And this is what we see social media really help to promote. Why do you think that is, that ideological identity would be the biggest source of, of violence? It's always war, again, as I told, but also, uh, for example, I do a lot of research on history and historical narratives and collective memory. And what's happening, for example, I'm writing now a book which shows how a collective memory functions as ideological construct. Because what is ideology? Ideology is uh, not always political. Uh, if we look into the very origin of ideology, it's something which creates meaning of the world for us, giving us clear perception of the future, giving us clear connection between past, present, and the future. And it's also giving us this uh, values, and values as evaluative and normative prescriptions for what should be done. So... Uh, if you look on ideology from this point of view as uh, its like original meaning of ideology, then you see this is exactly all this uh, internet communities function as ideological groups. Yeah, it seems like ideological uh, stances are are things that you can convince yourself more certainly of as opposed to religious or ethnic, there, there's more of a chance of you reaching some specific logical, in your mind, logical conclusion. And, and that seems more, maybe more motivating than the other. Yeah, because if you look into extreme meaning of uh, ideology, it's a myth, right? What is myth? Myth is a concept about the world. 
and ancient Greeks were living in myths and they believe gods is like there, right? And the same way we have now, every group has their ideological ideas about how world should be organized, what is important, what is not important. And in this case, we see, uh, first of all, uh, this communities and internet functioning like this community, having their own myths and their own perceptions. There are a lot of what's called fake news, which create the uh, alternative reality. But we also see insults as a key there, because for these groups, it's very important to insult other groups as not having right values, not having education. And we see this insult from both sides. And we know that... Uh, for example, Hillary Clinton lost last time because she was using a lot of insults, like basket of deplorables. It should not come from the leader. Yeah, that was a bad. Uh, that was a bad decision. Even though she, in her defense, she did say half, and then she also said it at a time when <laughs> just one, when, when, even one. I know she should. She, she definitely should have said. Should yeah. have said it. But she also didn't under. I think everybody underestimated how many Trump supporters there were. So she. She made a tactical mistake in thinking mm-hmm. that there was not going to be much price to pay for that. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, this is important. If you if you really bring important values, you should follow values, right? You should not be like another side. Mm-hmm. And that's what I see. Yeah, that's what bothers me about of uh, uh, I see so many uh, liberal people, anti-Trump people, uh, using the same kind of. Uh, insulting uh, language that Trump uses. And, I, and I'm just thinking, you know, let's, that is not the answer. That is not how we uh, Absolutely. He- heal things, you know. Absolutely. This is very important. If you want to change the world, you should not mirror the tactics of uh, Trump, right? Or you should not mirror the tactics of North Korea. And for example, in the situation of Ukraine and uh, Russia, again, I also wrote about it in the book, it's the same as um, Ukraine, instead of become a liberal space and liberal state uh, really uh, mimic uh, Russian totalitarian uh, and position developing very 19th century ethnic concept of national identity. So then you see this and insulting each other, continuous insulting each other in the same way. Did you happen to read uh, Francis Fukuyama's book, Identity? Yeah, of course. Mm-hmm. That was great. That was, for anyone listening, that was a great examination of our what seems to be our fracturing into these you know, different identity-based groups. And he also talks at the end how about how social media, uh, internet and social media play a role in that. Reminded me of what you were talking about. Yeah, there are a lot of um, very thoughtful people really analyzing how identity play a very important role. And if we speak about even resource-based conflict and real politics, at the end, it's social identity dynamics which made this conflict really protracted. So identity is not the source of conflict. It's not a result of conflict. But it's something which change conflict in such a strong way that it's become protracted and very hard to resolve. So uh, I, I was reading about a study, a 1967 study by Robert Abelson, and it showed that the subjects who were insulted during a discussion their positions were made more stubborn and more extreme. Do you happen to know about that study? And do you see that tying in with how internet and social media might be making people uh, more extreme and more hardened in their positions? No, I don't know this particular study, but I clearly see, but I read multiple other studies. For example, there are pretty interesting uh, body of literature about Southern uh, pride, and how its impact. I was really interested to find this body of literature when I was doing research on insult uh, and how insult play a role in a Southern culture and Latin American culture, for example. It's mm. very it's very important part. But yes, what actually people are trying to achieve by insulting other parties is changing their behavior, right? You're not just insult people to make them feel bad. You, ch- you use insult to change their behavior. So if you make other party more stubborn or you make other party less efficient, this is so your insult achieves the goal. That's why it's very important to analyze how people are uh, uh, using this insult. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it seems like so much of any nation's history how the, the, the twists and turns of a nation's history are, are, are under the 
under the hood uh, due to these these insults of, of various groups. Yeah. yeah, and you you know from history there are multiple examples and uh, people specifically used insult to make people behave aggressively and to lose the control and take advantage of it. So insult was in many cases was used. There are many, many historical examples, but you also can have this example from the life. Uh, then you insult the person specifically to make this person weaker and act aggressively and not thinking. So this has been Dr. Karina Krostalina. Yeah, thanks so much for coming on. This has been a great talk. Mm-hmm. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to the People Who Read People podcast with me, Zach Elwood. If you'd like to read more about the impact of social media on political division, I recently wrote a piece entitled The Psychology Behind How Social Media Increases Polarization, and I'm pretty proud of it. It cites various psychological studies and effects and examines how the internet and social media amplify some negative social tendencies we have. You should be able to find that by searching for Zachary Elwood Social Media Polarization. If you'd like to learn more about this podcast, go to my website at readingpokertells.video. If you like this podcast, please consider leaving it a rating on iTunes. That's the best way you can send your appreciation. Thanks for listening. Music by Small Skies.